All right. So the database that you choose can make or break your entire application. And in 2025, the landscape has changed dramatically. So after building systems of all three of these databases for over 25 years, I can tell you the conventional wisdom is not necessarily always the one to follow. SQLite isn't just for small apps anymore. Postgres SQL isn't always the premium choice, and MySQL isn't the performance king everybody that thought it used to be. So I've architected systems processing millions of transactions daily, and I've seen firsthand how the right database choice can save you thousands of development hours and hundreds of thousands in infrastructure costs. So today I'm gonna to show you exactly what database you should be using for your specific needs. Now again, this is always gonna differ per your needs, but there's gonna be some interesting things here that'll, show, that'll surprise you, especially when we start talking about SQLite, so let's jump in. Welcome to Startup Pack. I'm Spencer Thomason here at Startup Pack. We love to train software developers in our licensed coding boot camps, as well as to build custom software solutions for companies. With over a decade as ex as ex of executive leadership as a fractional CTO and 25 years in software development, I've mastered transforming tech teams and product. All right. So choosing between SQLite, PostgreSQL, and MySQL in 2025 is a lot more nuanced than most developers realize. Now, I think everybody has their flavors that they really like, but let's dive into some of this. So to choose between SQLite, Postgres, and MySQL, um, you're gonna have to really look at things. And each has evolved dramatically over the past few years, and the old rule of thumbs don't necessarily apply anymore. So the latest benchmarks show that SQLite actually outperforms both Postgres SQL and MySQL for read-heavy workloads with under 10,000 concurrent connections. You heard that right. So uh, my, uh, SQLite is really killing it, and they're doing a lot of great work. Postgres SQL optimization has made massive strides in the last two years, and are now handling complex joins up to 40% faster than MySQL in real-world applications. MySQL still edges out the competition on simple CRUD operations by about 15 to 20% when properly optimized, but I've run some exhaustive benchmarks on all three for fintech clients in the last month, and Postgres SQL's handling of JSON data was nearly twice as fast as MySQL. So I think that's really where Postgres SQL's really shine right now is on their JSON parsing. So the gap between SQLite and the big databases has narrowed so much that for many applications, the file-based database is actually the performance winner, which is really interesting, right? So I haven't used SQLite a ton as of recent because mostly we're building uh, you know, enterprise SaaS type products and you don't normally think of SQLite when you think of that. But I was actually really impressed as I started to dig into some of the benchmarks that I read here. So SQLite's serverless nature makes it perfect for edge computing and containerized environments where it can scale horizontally in ways that it was almost impossible five years ago. PostgreSQL's logical replication in version 16 plus has transformed its scaling capabilities, making a legitimate option for globally distributed applications. MySQL's cluster offerings still provide the most straightforward path to massive scale for teams without dedicated DBAs. So cloud providers now offer offer optimized versions of all three of these databases that abstract away many of the traditional uh, scaling limitations and problems in getting set up and backing up, right? Now, let's talk about some of the developer experience and productivity, and then I'm gonna dive into some of these benchmarks here. So SQLite requires virtually zero maintenance, which means your developers spend time building features instead of managing inf infrastructure. So if you want a database that just works um, and, you know, and you know it's gonna remain small, SQLite is a great option. And by small, I mean like less than 10,000 records. PostgreSQL's rich type system and advanced features can cut development time by 30-40% for complex domain models. Now MySQL's widespread adoption means finding developers with deep expertise is really easier than a lot of the other ones. But PostgreSQL in my experience is really catching up on this very quickly. Now, <clears throat> where Postgres really shines is its JSON capabilities, and they've evolved to the point where hybrid relational document models can be implemented without the complexity of running separate databases. I've been using that a lot with Postgres, where we know these there are these tables, and we'll do them when they're static, but if you're doing forms that you know are gonna change or something like that, we'll do them to JSON, and then get some use in, let the development settle down, and then maybe convert to tables later with a good repository layer in your code. Now, SQLite simplicity means that new team members can be become productive in hours rather than weeks that it might take to master, you know, Postgres and some of those. Now, let's talk about some of the hidden costs and total ownership here, right? Because SQLite has essentially zero licensing and operational costs, which can save startup hundreds of thousands of dollars in critical years. Postgres SQL's advanced features often require more specialized and expensive talent to fully leverage. MySQL's enterprise support options create a clearer path for organizations with strict compliance requirements. Now, 
I've repeatedly seen database choices that seem cheaper up front. They become massively expensive when accounting for maintenance and scaling. Now, cloud-hosted Postgres SQL services are typically about 15 to 30% more expensive than equivalent MySQL offerings. But we're starting to see that number come down a bit too as Postgres becomes more and more uh, uh, common. Now, speaking of systems that work together, if your company is struggling with database integrations or multiple systems that aren't communicating, reach out because here at Startup Pack, our specialty is connecting systems to help your company work like a well-oiled machine. So check out startuppack.com slash Spencer and we can help you out. So let's jump into some of these benchmarks here because I can keep going and talking about this stuff all day long. We've, uh, you know, I've worked with a lot of these for a long time, but here's a great article and I'll make sure that I link it down below. Um, but I want to kind of talk through some of these benchmarks that, that they ran and that they had found, right? So when they ran this, they found that Postgres insertion times was, you know, and this is, um, <clears throat> So this guy goes through and shows you exactly what he has set up here and for what he's inserting and everything. Um, so he goes through and breaks this all down, but I kind of just want to just jump right into the benchmarks here that he has. And so basically the, for the same data sets, uh, you know, insertion time for Postgres SQLs, 19, uh, you know, almost two seconds, right? Uh, transactional insertion time was, you know, less than a, less than a second. Select was, you know, eight milliseconds, delete five milliseconds. Now for MySQL for the same, you know, almost double the, the, the speed, about the same for transactional insertion time and about the same for select and delete times, right? Not a lot of different deletes, a little more expensive, but my is actually here, the surprising one, right? So your insertion times is definitely lower, but your transactional search is ridiculously low and your selects and your deletes are also way faster. So this is what's really interesting about this, right? So when we get down to the right performance, right? On your insertion, SQLite actually can insert um, and is a little bit slower. And this is gonna make sense because it's a disk-based, you know, flat file operating uh, uh, database system. So this is gonna, you know, make sense, but Postgres here is the winner on this one. Now, um, <clears throat> you know, it outshined both MySQL and for, for those. Now, uh, for the select and delete performance, right? So this is where it got really interesting here. So select and delete, um, you know, for delete, po my, uh, SQLite was a little slower, but for select, and again, this was with less than, you know, 10,000 rows. The interesting thing here is SQLite achieved the fastest select time, making an excellent choice for read heavy applications. So we've had something that's a, you know, a, a pretty static set of data set that you need to read. And, and maybe you have a system where write doesn't matter quite as much. Then like MySQL or SQLite is a great option here. You can see that SQL, uh, MySQL and Postgres we're pretty close to the delete. You know, MySQL is a lot slower, which is kind of interesting. Um, but you can see SQLite, you know, definitely is holding its own in these, right? So really the big, uh, you know, takeaway that he came away with was kind of some of the things that I've summarized for you here before. And so if you're looking for a really big, powerful system and you already have some great database experience with Postgres, my general recommendation is with the strength of SQL uh, with a JSON that you can query right into it and combine both uh, traditional um, relational database plus document management with the JSON strength that, that Postgres has, then you can go with Postgres. If you don't have anybody who knows Postgres very well, uh, one of the other ways to lower the bar in making Postgres really easy to use is use a hosted option. We use DigitalOcean. Uh, most of the production systems are very reasonably cost. It's not like some of the other cloud options where they scale out of control really fast. It's a set fixed number. And then as you use that, we've found that it works really well. So that's a really great way to kind of lower that bar because you're not having to set up and maintain it or worry about any the backups and everything. MySQL is not a bad choice, right? Definitely been proven through a lot of, you know, has a lot of track record. But SQLite is the surprising one that's really coming up to shine. And it's really interesting that you can take SQLite and deploy it with your application and, and leave it on the server and then be able to use it, especially local against a SaaS. Uh, you know, if you have a smaller SaaS system or if you're using a lot of microservices, SQLite is definitely a great choice, especially if you're um, really using, you know, strong um, microservices with self-contained systems. And SQLite is definitely a great option. So with teams with smaller than less than 10 developers, you know, SQLite is a great, great option. Um, 
And so, you know, definitely be looking into some of these and make sure you do your research before you dive into building a big SaaS system because having the wrong database system can really hurt you. Now, if you aren't sure, feel free to reach out to me. You can always hit me up at spencer at startuphack.com or reach out to me at startuphack.com slash spencer and, and hit me up there. Um, I love to get compliments, or excuse me, <laughs> love to get compliments. Everybody loves compliments, but comments on my videos here. So if you can give me a comment, let me know things that you like, things you disagree with. What are your thoughts? I love to hear from you guys. It's the best compliment I can get. Here at Startup Pack, we love to train software developers in our licensed coding boot camps, as well as to build custom software solutions for companies. So reach out because we'd love to help and here's some great information for you. Want to become a software developer but don't want to spend four years in college and rack up massive student loan debts? Think you need technical expertise to get started? Welcome to Startup Pack, a better way to start your software career without student loans and years without income. One-on-one -on -one tutoring is included so you never get stuck and have guidance through the whole process. No technical experience is necessary. Learn at your own pace and in your own space. Startup Pack has worked with local state agencies in your area to make it so that qualifying students can get the program costs covered entirely and students can start earning while they learn. StartupHacks.net Coding Bootcamp was a game changer for my career. As someone with no prior programming experience, I was initially intimidated by the idea of learning to code. But the instructors at Startup Hack broke down complex concepts into easy to understand lessons and provided hands-on projects that really cemented my understanding. The curriculum was comprehensive and up-to-date and got me ready for my first job. What really set Startup Pack apart was to focus on practical, real-world skills. Thanks to Startup Pack, I landed my dream job as a .NET developer within weeks of graduating. I went from knowing nothing about code to building professional grade web applications in just a few intense months. If you're looking to break into .NET development or level up your coding skills, I cannot recommend Startup Pack enough. Complete our three month coding boot camp, gain hands on experience, and land a paid internship. With two years of experience, on average, our graduates are making over $80,000 per year. The three month program includes technologies from Microsoft, Google, and Facebook. No debt, just a quick path to earning. Check out startuphack.com to code your future and start today.